<laughs> Don't you hate it when people do that? <laughs> what does Carl Barron say? I'm swallowing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> announcing. Like the big sip. I get it if it's hot. Oh, the big sip's annoying. I get it if it's hot, but just like... Yeah, see, that's... You can do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, another week. Another week. There it is. You do sip with a pinky out. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> another week. Mm, feels good. Feels good. It does. How are you going? I'm going well, thank God. Pretty much the same as always. Doing well. Doing well. <laughs> How well, are you going? That's a lot to be thankful for. Yes. If you're right. doing well, we're doing a lot better than a lot of other people around the world. So. Amen. Doing okay. Doing okay. I've uh, had a big week, business end of the liturgical mm. season now in Lent. We've got a lot of preparation for the Holy Week liturgies at the cathedral. This is not self-promotion in any way, <laughs> but if you have never, ever experienced a Holy Week at St. Mary's Cathedral, please make an effort on your own or with your family to get to a Holy Week or the major liturgies. The, um, the Lord's Supper, even if you're not doing anything on a Thursday morning, the Chrism Mass where all the oils are blessed and all the priests renew their priestly promises. These are beautiful events on a Thursday, then on Friday, Stations of the Cross and the Lord's Passion at 3 p.m. And then Saturday night vigil at the cathedral in all of its glory is one of the most beautiful things you'll see. That's so awesome. I highly encourage people to get out to that at least once in your life. I encourage everyone to stay in their parishes always, but once at least get out to our mother church, not only just Sydney, but Australia and have a look at that. And while we're just talking about the cathedral and Holy Week, mm. I'll, I was going to do this as a, um, as an announcement, but let's just keep flowing with it. <laughs> um, we are really being encouraged to intensify our prayer, our fasting and our alms giving in these next couple of weeks. So, you may not have had the greatest Lent. You may have come up a little short with your penances and practices or you might be doing it a bit tough. But just remember, Jesus is walking that narrow path to Calvary now and you can do that with him and he'll help carry the weight of your cross. So um, please remember and to all of our Catholics watching, um, this is the time of year um, that it is preferred that you receive the Eucharist at least once in the year and confess all your mortal sins. So there should be increased and available confession times at every parish. So make an attempt. And I always say to people, if it's been a long time, don't fear. Be be calm, be gentle with yourself. The priest is there to assist you if you don't know how to go about a confession. Okay? Um, and it's the most beautiful thing in the world. So I highly encourage people to get to confession and go to Mass and really make this Easter season what it's truly about. It's not the Easter show or eggs. It's, <laughs> it's about our Lord's passion, death and resurrection. So let's get into that. I second this message. Sorry, Father. <laughs> um, what's, what's your thought on our liturgical celebrations and being hijacked by you know, Easter Bunny, eggs, Santa Claus... Things like that. I have some very strong thoughts on these <laughs> things. <laughs> um, we have young, impressionable uh, people that watch this. We do. Yeah. We do. There is always going to be a time for the Easter Bunny and for Santa Claus. But those moments do not belong in our liturgy. When we go, and this is a whole misconception of, um, or a lack of understanding of what the Mass actually is. A lot of people don't understand what it is. Mass liturgy is our work. It's our worship. We go to worship God. We don't go to worship ourselves. Um, and that's actually has been the case where it's been hijacked. Some people like to say, well, when we promote these things, we, um, we're making it more hospitable for people to come to Mass. We're making it more interesting for the kids. Um, and I disagree because we've had that approach for a number of decades now and it's failed and it continues to fail. So I don't, I don't ascribe to any of those types of things. 
people will know if you've ever had an experience with myself when it comes to liturgy. I just do the red and I say the black as we as the saying goes in the missal. So you don't get any you don't get any right or left turns from me, no backflips, no no circus acts. It's just the liturgy because it's not about me, it's about our worship of God. But then after mass, I'll be shaking hands and joking with people and I'm I know I've done it in the past. I've given out Easter eggs after Mass as a gift to the people that have come there. So that's no problem at all. But just properly differentiate what these things are. Don't allow it to become just about, oh, we need to modernise, we need to... Because it's, it's been very well proven already that none of this stuff works anymore. And you oftentimes find that the parishes that hold on to this, they actually... It's almost deceitful. Because they don't, it's just, oh, this is what we do and what we've always done. Well, maybe if you change that, maybe if you change it and you just go back to worshipping God, then God will bring the community together the way it should be. And I also think it's laziness too. Sorry, we've started the show this way, my goodness. Um, This is a great way to start. (laughs) I, I think it's laziness as well because you don't want to do anything outside of that set time of your 10 o'clock mass. So we've got to involve, you know, an appearance from the Easter Bunny or we've got to make sure that we give all the kids eggs, you know, before the final blessing or whatever it might be. That's all rubbish. It's like that's laziness. If you really want to get serious about creating a community, then do an Easter sausage sizzle after mass where you encourage all the parishioners to hang around for a good hour or so after mass. And the ones that actually want to stay will stay. And the ones that want to go will go. And we can't fall into that mindset of, oh, no, you have to involve everyone because people have Easter plans or Christmas plans. That's good they have plans, but some people don't have plans. So I'm not going to confine, you know, that, that element of hospitality into the liturgy where it doesn't belong just because of this misguided notion that we should all be doing things together all the time. So... I reckon if parishes have it together, they'll have a hospitality committee, they'll have people that can put on actual events after these masses. So the mass is the mass and then we socialise afterwards. Or we actually set apart a few times a year where we have it in our church calendar for your specific parish that this is the big parish function, that we do this together to come together or... um, We'll do the barbecue, we'll do the fate, we'll do whatever it might be. But that's what we do and we keep it all separate to the mass. I digress. And it offers the, the beauty in the mass also, other than, other than the actual worship of God, is that we, we're completely retreating from the world. Mm. And it's, com- it's something completely different. And we're, we're now meeting with uh with i don't know a, a place for lack of a better word outside of time and space and so it's a complete retreat from the outside world and so if we're just getting what we can get from the outside world in mass then what's the point of going to mass anyway mm. like why would anyone why would anyone waste their time going to mass to get easter eggs and to meet an easter bunny when they can just do it at bankstown central or something it's true you know it's and true. Then, yeah I don't know. That's well, we have sense. done what you would call a flipping of the script. <laughs> so I reckon we just keep going. Let's do it. Let's go. Um, a lot of the time, the, the worship element and the, the mass element can be hijacked for a reason that I preached about um, this weekend at mass that just passed. And that is we fear to be, to be vulnerable. We fear to be vulnerable. So what I mean by that is it's better that we have the priest that is always joking and clowning around than the priest that is talking about serious things. It's better that we have the concerts throughout the Mass than actually have music that is suitable to the liturgical season we're in. It's better um, to hijack the prayers of the faithful and go all like weirdly social justice 
when this time of year we actually have to be more about a dying to self, repentance, a reconversion, all those types of things. Um, it is easier to always look to the happy-go-lucky side of things than it is to actually confront what Jesus said in his gospel this weekend. And before I get into that gospel, the reason all of this um, needs to be seriously reconsidered is because people are falling away from the faith in numbers and droves. And so... If we're not going to live our lives, okay, if you're a practicing Christian, if you're not going to live your life in accordance with the liturgical seasons, then when a time like this comes, you're going to be like a fish out of water. Okay? You've walked into our churches, statues are covered up, there isn't music for a recession or you're supposed to walk out in silence. All of these types of things move us toward the greatest act of love anyone has ever known. And so many people will miss that because of a misguided notion that, no, we need to be welcoming, hospitable, accommodating. We need the music to be uplifting. We need jokes. We need Easter eggs. We need all sorts of things to really keep the people in. And I think we're really doing a disservice to those people because if that's all it is, then Anthony, you're completely right. They could go to Woolworths and meet the Easter Bunny there and feel good about themselves. Yeah. But what Jesus is about to do is literally carry his cross down a very narrow path that as we read in the scriptures, very few take. But that's the only path to heaven. It's the only way to heaven is going down that path. And the gospel this weekend was about the mustard seed. Unless the mustard seed falls into the ground and dies, it cannot have life. And so the man that chooses to protect his own life on this earth will lose it. Because what does that look like? That looks like pleasure. That looks like um, excess. It looks like not caring about the truth, always wanting to be popular going with the motion of what the current ideology is that's just grounded in rubbish, all that kind of stuff. Whereas the person that loses their life for the sake of God will gain it. And we've seen what this does. I mean, you've, you, could, you know about this in your own life. When you're, you and your siblings um, all kind of had this real deeper kind of reversion into the faith, look at the fruit that that's all born, you know? It's like an amazing youth group led by you guys and you brought people in. You know, it's like things became attractive to other people because there were normal people living their faith. Yeah. Um, whereas there's nothing special about the person that just lives their life and doesn't care about what they're doing or what they're buying or the way they're, they're living their private lives because most of the time it's always oriented to self. And so that's a grain that doesn't die. That's a grain that just is obsessed with self. And Jesus talks about the time. Now is the time. My hour has come. And look at everything else through scriptures. He didn't say anything because his hour had not yet come. Or he slipped through the crowd because it was not his time. Like, have you ever thought about why... That's all said. Coming to this very moment now, this week in the readings, now is the time for my name to be glorified. Wow. This is the hour. This is the reason that I left my throne in heaven and came down to earth, was born a baby, lived all these years that I lived, performed my public ministry. This is the hour now. And now I'm going to pick up my cross. And you saw how special that was to him because he even says, my heart is sorrowful. So look at what that means to Jesus, how important it is to fulfill his mission, this mission of love. And we saw what he said to those people that tried to get in the way of that mission. Peter, for example. 
Not you, Lord, surely. Get behind me, Satan. You think like man does. No, no, he's saying, I've come to do the will of my father and the will of my father is to do this out of love for you. And that's what I talk about where it makes people feel uncomfortable to be vulnerable because that love that God shows us, that God that love, the, the love that God wants to shower upon all of us, this is the love that makes people uncomfortable. Because when you let that type of love into your life, this is scratching beyond the surface now. When you let that love into your life, what does that mean? That means I need to change the way I'm living. That means I need to question everything that I believe in, that more than likely you've been fed via your social media feeds over the last five, ten years. That's absolute rubbish. It means that I might have to confront myself and look in the mirror and say, am I living the way I should? It might also mean for people in relationships, this relationship is not going to get me to heaven. It might also mean to a married couple, we should be more courageous and have more children. Why is this an anxiety for us? Why don't we do it? It might mean for a young man, I'm going to consider the priesthood. Or for a young woman, I'm going to consider consecrated or religious life. That's why people are afraid of the love that God is about to shower on them, which is why we want distraction in mass. Because that sacrifice, ultimately people are saying, is not enough for us. It's not enough to keep us enticed because we want entertainment, we want to be distracted. But on the deepest of deep levels, they've got no idea the way God wants to love them. And if they opened up their hearts to that love just an ounce, it would be a very different world. So for the person that wants to keep their life on this earth, it's generally a very kind of self-centered life. But anyone who will lose it for the sake of God, you're going to bear fruit like the mustard seed does. The mustard seed sprouts and look at what happens when it does. When you see that tree, there are birds in it, there's life, there's all sorts of things. People take shade under it. It, it brings so much. And so, so important to remember those words of Jesus. And then the Father, again, for the third time, speaks. Okay? For the third time he speaks. He spoke at the baptism. He spoke at the transfiguration. And he speaks here in this gospel. My son will be glorified. I will glorify him and he will be glorified again. And everyone's like, well, what was that? Clap of thunder? Was that the angels? What was it? And Jesus said, it wasn't for my sake that he spoke. I speak to the guy all the time. <laughs> I speak to my father in prayer all the time. It's for your sake that he spoke so that you can hear this again. And so this is, this is where we're moving now. Jesus is coming to his hour. And I, I suppose by extension, each and every one of us will get to that point in our life where we come to our hour. And at its end, it will be the end of our life. We will come to the end of our life. But we come to that moment when we're thinking about our vocations, when we're thinking about the way we're loving, the way we're acting, thinking, behaving. We come to that hour a lot of the time. We have those little micro, the minutes, I suppose. The hour's a big decision, but the minute, it's like minute by minute by minute. Do I say something to this person who's mocking the faith? Do I stand up with courage and love and conviction and correct someone who is ignorant or they're misguided about something regarding Jesus and the love he has for us? Do I sacrifice my own want in this moment for the needs of others? You can make those little minute decisions every day. And the more we focus on those little minute decisions, when we get to our hour, we'll know what we have to do. So that's the, um, that was the gospel. The there big is, one indeed. <laughs> yeah, that's massive. There's so much, so much in there. I, um, I wanted to add to something and then I have a few questions if that's, <laughs> um, 
So the first thing I wanted to add is we hear about love so much, um, especially when we talk about the Christian faith, is love, 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 and then everyone thinks, oh, yeah, it's just, you know, love everyone, and it's just like a side thing. Um, but we, I think we speak about it so much that, uh, and, and sometimes it's even been uh, spoken about in a way where it's just like a, a sort of a passing thing. Like it's, uh, it's not that important. Like Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And yeah. then move on. And it's yeah. like, it's all, um, I think I've said it before, like a Barney sort of thing. Like I love you, you love yeah. me, you know, and it becomes sort of a joke. Like mm. that you just sort of pass on and we're like, all right, we've heard enough about love. Let's move on to like, to other things, you know, the hard hitting things. But like you said, this is one of the hardest things to accept. And um, I remember I was at a talk and uh, this, the, the speaker said, God is madly in love with you. And then I thought, oh, that's nice. <laughs> and then he said it again, God is madly in love with you. And then he looked at a girl in the front row and he said, I want you to know, or do you know, or something, God is madly in love with you. And she just burst out into tears. And I think so much of it is that we think that we're so unlovable. We believe that no one can love us the way that God loves us. Mm. It's impossible. And I spoke about this in our very first episode, I believe, is that we attribute so much of our human flaws to God. And so if we can't do it, we're like, oh, well, God, there's no way God can... You know, God's the same as us. Um, and so uh, it, it's actually a really deep thing that you can't just really hear and then just go, oh, yeah, I get it. Mm. It's actually something that we have to, um, we have to contemplate. <laughs> um, and, and it'll, like, it'll cause you to cry. <laughs> it's, um, it, it, it'll really get the, get the tears going. Mm. Um because of how you realize, yeah, you're probably not deserving of that love. Um, but you are. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We probably haven't earned that love, but God says, no, you deserve it anyway. Yeah. Like, uh, that's probably a better way to put it. But yeah, free and unmerited. Yes. And that's what God's love is for us. Yeah. And so I think we, yeah, that, that's something that I think everyone just n needs to really contemplate is, Maybe you see yourself as unlovable, but really, like, really contemplate on the crucifix, you know, and on literally everything that in your life. <laughs> you just have to look around you and know how good God is mm -hmm. and how much He loves you. But but especially that crucifix and coming up to to Good Friday, um, just to understand, like, you are you are lovable, and you're He's deemed you worthy of the love that he's giving, you know, that unconditional love. Even to admit or, or to try and even think that you're unlovable, I think there's an element of depth in that thought. Yeah. Because most people, now I'm not a reader of hearts here, but <laughs> most people don't even ask that question. Mm. Mo a lot of people are under the guise that I am lovable, but the type of love that they're thinking about is affirmed in the illicit relationships that they're having or um, or the amount or how popular they are on social media yeah, or yeah. it's very surface level. So even to get to the point where you say, oh, well, I'm, I'm no good, I'm washed up. Like even that's a deep thought, which is great because it can lead you to an even deeper thought, which is that. But we can walk around with in the illusion that I'm fine the way I am. And the reality is no, you're not. No, I'm not. I'm not fine the way I am because look at even that mindset is I'm thinking about myself again. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't need to self-improve. I don't need really to have this really intimate connection with God because God just loves me, so it's okay. And I can go on about my life sinning. Um, I don't got to go to Mass because God is everywhere, all that kind of stuff. That's... That's the, the illusion that we can fall under, especially in the culture we live in now. So distracted by so many things, by what people think about us, by what we look like in public. Um, it's no good. 
It's poisonous. So we spoke about God's time or Christ saying that now his time has come. So he's at that point. And he prays, uh, or he says, um, and, and you alluded to it, something along the lines of, uh, you know, my heart is sorrowful. But then he says, um, but what should I say? Father, save me from this hour, for it is this hour that I've come. Or you know, something along those lines. Yes, it was for this very reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Firstly, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... That's something that we, well, I would hope that I can pray when the time comes for myself, right? Mm. But one of the things that I have struggled with for a long time is uh, is the thought of death, more so the thought of eternity as well, <laughs> is a scary thought. Mm. Um, but w- would you have any... I don't know how practical you could really get in it, but would you have any sort of advice for um, for someone like me who struggles with the thought of death and who maybe like who, who even fears death to get to a point where we can pray that same prayer that, that Christ does there? It's deep. Um, when, when the Israelites were in the wilderness and they were mumbling and bickering and whinging what was their punishment do you remember in exodus Plague? what did what did god send uh, down no after they were exiled oh uh, yeah what was what did god send down from heaven to punish them the fiery serpents oh uh, yes yeah yes so people are getting sick and they're dying and then moses pleads with god God, please, like, look at, and even the way he pleads, like, look at what the Egyptians will think. Have you sent, have you sent us out here to starve, um, to die of thirst, and then to be killed by these things? Mm -hmm. And so Moses intercedes. But then what does God give as the answer to their death? He says, fashion, fashion a serpent and put it on a stand and raise it up. So the very thing that was killing them is the very thing they had to look to in faith to be saved. And so in response to a person that might feel very, we all feel uncomfortable with the thought of death. How often do we meditate on death? How, How often do we look at it and think about it? to know that my life will one day come to an end on this earth. But then think about the beautiful sacrifice our Lord's about to make and what his resurrection means for us who live a life of Christ faithfully. So there there is a guarantee that our soul will live forever, no matter who you are. It just becomes where that soul will live forever. And God doesn't will that anyone anyone spend eternity without him that's not what he wants because we have a god of love but love is relationship love is a two-way street so we need to love god in return and he has shown us because he knows us best the way to love him so we've got the commandments and in the church we've got our liturgies We've got sacraments that bring grace, that give us strength to be able to grow, to mature, to be stronger in fa- in the face of adver- adversity. So we've got all of these things. But yeah, you've got you to gotta face it. And not face it by doing silly things. <laughs> you've got to face it by meditating. Like the, a lot of the saints um, in a lot of the, um, in a lot of the, friaries and convents and all sorts of things that they had in the churches um memento mori is the saying remember your death remember that you will die that's what it means wow and so like to meditate on these things constantly help bring us to a point where we will get to that point and there will be peace 
and we're coming up to the solemnity of the patron of a happy death, St. Joseph. St. Joseph is coming up very shortly and so we ask for his intercession that I might have a happy and peaceful death. But in the short time I've been a priest, I can honestly say that my experience with death is probably more pronounced than your regular person because I'll go to nursing homes, hospitals, houses of people where there are loved ones dying. Um, and when I walk into those places, there is always a stark difference between the Catholic who has practiced, who has struggled and wrestled, they don't have their life together perfectly, but in their final moments there's a peace about them. Whereas people who don't really care about faith, they're maybe lukewarm, they don't go to Mass, they haven't had these deeper thoughts, they're freaking out. Them and their families are freaking out to the point where they make it hard for me to minister because they don't even want what I am doing in the room. They would prefer to handle it their own way than allow a church's minister to walk in and minister to that person who whose soul is in such desperate need of that healing before they leave this earth. And families actually stop priests from doing that. And that's because they haven't meditated, they haven't thought about it. There's, they don't want to do the hard thing. They don't want to open themselves up and be vulnerable to a love that will make them change their life. And that's, that's sad, but we have to respect the freedom of, of people, but we face it. We have to face it. The more you face it now, the easier it will become. Like the martyrs built themselves up in courage for the day of their martyrdom. Mm. They didn't just freely give their life the day they died. They loved God with all their heart, mind, soul and strength, all their life to the point where they were dealing with daily <coughs> excuse me, daily trials, daily adversities, daily struggles. And rather than run away from those things, they faced them. So by the time they got to that point, they were able to freely give their life for God. And so that's what I pray we're all going to be in a position to do, is day by day face the reality that we're not here forever. And even think about this for a second. If you're in that mindset, how much more differently will you treat your family? Will you treat your friends? Will you approach your work? How less lazy would you become? Well, tomorrow's not guaranteed to me, so I shouldn't waste today. If there's stuff I've got to work on, I should be working on. I'm not going to leave it until tomorrow. But this is, the, this is even the danger now of this real distraction culture that we have. It's easier to waste time, to binge on social media, streaming services. It's easier to do all of that than it is to actually face serious things in life. So face it from now. That's a very long response to that question, but well, it was great. I Thank hope you. I've given enough to to help people think about that. Yeah. So Passion Tide has begun, is that right? Fifth Sunday of Lent okay. and on. So Passion Tide is the fifth Sunday and into Holy Week. Holy Week is in Passion Tide. Yep. Yep. Okay, so so statues generally are covered by now. Yep. Why are they covered now if we haven't reached? Because we're on the way. We're on the way. We're okay. we are we are focusing now more intently on our Lord's journey to Calvary. Ah, uh, okay. So look, the gospel is my hour is here. That was a gospel on uh, on I Sunday. See. Yeah. My hour is here. He's saying it now. It's like now there's nothing good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now it's gonna be all right, everyone. You were happy when I was multiplying loaves and fishes and healing you of this, that, and the other. But now my hour has come. Okay. And because he's announced his hour has come, basically. He's like announcing he's his hour. This is come. this is the final stretch right I now. See, yeah, okay. And you'll see it in the readings this week, in the lead up to Palm Sunday. He'll have that triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. But it's not good after that. <laughs> wow. And 
we're the greatest at giving spoiler alerts in Catholicism. Yeah. <laughs> it's not all bad news, which is why we called the worst day in human history Good Friday. It's pretty good like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah, so that's we, really put it we, into We narrow it. We focus our attention now. So the glory of the saints, all the statues, all those types of things, they're all covered up because there's no glory. There's no glory. Now it's this. Wow. Now it's this. That's really put it into perspective. Wow. There's so much to think about. There is. There is. My head's going. Uh, but we've got. Mile a minute, as they say. We've got a lot to talk about, though. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Did you have any more questions on this gospel, or shall we move forward? Um, I think we can uh, move forward. Look, look. Maybe at the end, when everything settles, you might have a question. I might have some questions. You might throw me a curveball. We would love to, as as we do always, thank our great sponsors at MJ Podiatry. And just to remind everyone, MJ Podiatry is a mobile home visit network servicing all throughout Sydney. It's an all-around podiatry service, uh, handing out general treatments, any treatments for sport, NDIS, and home care packaging are offered as well. Um, for your pains, injuries, custom-made orthotics, advice on footwear, whatever you like, whatever you need, MJ Podiatry has got your back and they've got your feet as well. Um, so please check out their website, which is down below, and contact MJ Podiatry at 0412 Three eight nine two seven eight, or email them at info at mjpodiatry.com.au and and there's a special passion tide discount ATG10 oh thank god for passion tide <laughs> the ATG10 promo code uh, we, uh, we we do love to thank MJ Podiatry um, for, for their support but really a, a um, a sort of call or uh, a suggestion, I guess, um, for you to, to really, if you have any issues with your feet, really check MJ Podiatry out and give them that uh, special Passion Tide promo code. <laughs> Passion Tide promo code. Because you know what? We all use our feet. I don't know about you, but my feet hurt after a hard day. <laughs> Been walking, true. we're doing the Lord's work. <laughs> and Maroon and the team want to contribute to the Lord's work by contributing to your feet. Amen. And so we just <laughs> get involved, book him, get your feet right for Holy Thursday. Just all it's that. Coming it it's coming up. It is coming up. It's coming up quick. So You have one week. Yeah. So if you've got those bunions or, <laughs> you know, if you've got blisters and I don't know what, what he does really, but, you know, he's... <laughs> toenails and things. Toenails, ingrowns or, you know, um, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> he's just he's brave enough to work in it. Just <laughs> just call MJ for Dietry. <laughs> call MJ for Dietry. He'll look after you. He'll look after you. <laughs> well, um, we have had a big round two. Full of full of expected results and upsets, full of correct and wrong tips from everyone here at the Against the Grain family. That's including our beautiful Bips. And so... The Bips. <laughs> the Bips. <laughs> That's right. And so we're going to kick off with the first game of round two, which was uh, the Broncos versus Rabbitohs on the Thursday night. Now, I feel we should just announce this when we, when we talk about the games. Oh, sorry. When we first announce the games. So we've got the Broncos, Rabbitohs. Broncos took the game out 28-18. We had our Bips... For their first pick. Have got it correct. Yes. Ding. The Bips. The Bips. <laughs> the majority of the Bips tips went to the Broncos. So congratulations to the Bips. We've got that correct. So, um, uh, the Rabbitohs played the same game two weeks in a row. So, they were losing at halftime. Then they came out firing in the second half. Scored two tries. Quick fire tries. And then... Just lost it again after that, oh. after that. So that was interesting. Every error or penalty in the rule book that you could possibly give away, the Rabbitohs gave away in this game. Mm. It was so weird. Um, but, I mean, they. I guess they're just not at their best yet. 
um, Lachlan Ilias is copping a little bit, which I think is undeserved. We'll get to that when he gets to the preview anyway, because there's some breaking news coming out of that. Latrell's carving up, though. He's actually playing really well, um, which I thought would be really good for the Rabbitohs, but obviously it's not a one-man team. The rest of the team <laughs> has, to, has to play their role. Um, Broncos were also, I reckon, far from their best. Um, but, I mean, dominant performance over a, an error and penalty um, stricken, I guess, <laughs> Rabbitohs yeah. team. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just, it was great. The left side defense was great. Pierre Cora and Cobo. Dean Mariner's chip and chase was pretty cool. Mm. Reminded me of a young Jarrah Yaye, which was, which was cool. Nice. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty simple game. What you saw is pretty much what you got. Now we come to a highly controversial game. <laughs> and we come to the Friday, first Friday night game, which was, the Cronulla Sharks against the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs. So the Sharks took the game out 25-6. And uh, the Bips tipped the Cronulla Sharks. The Bips. Two for two. Two for two. Well, well done. done. Well done. Congratulations. So we're two for two for the Bips. Now, there's a lot to talk about here. Where do we start? Where do we start? Let's just start, I reckon, with the ref referee controversy that's coming out of it mm. just so we can get it out of the way mm. okay um all the bulldogs fans have been complaining about the ref i don't think i don't think it's particularly unreasonable to have complaints um it's it's kind of been proven by the eye test that uh the bottom the bottom teams don't usually get you know the 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 50-50 calls going their way. Yeah. And Serrato spoke about that. Yeah. <laughs> Said they weren't really 50-50 though. <laughs> More 80-20. <laughs> um, but, um, I mean, look, there, there were questionable calls and things. Like, I, I'm, I'm not against... I, I don't think that ref is bad. Ziggy. Big Ziggy. <laughs> Ziggy. <laughs> big Ziggy, I don't think is a bad ref generally. I, I, like... It could be the ref. It could be like it could have been him. It could have been touch judges. Mm. Bunker in his ear. You don't know. Bad decisions were made. Like okay, wrong decisions, whatever. Kick outs disallowed try. Like uh, to to be a hundred percent honest, I don't think if it was called a try, I don't think anyone would complain. Yeah. Uh, or would have a right to complain. Yeah. The fact that it was called a no try, I understand the complaints, uh, but I'm not. I don't think that it was necessarily a wrong call either i mean he was he was impeded by the ref yeah uh this is where i think letter of the law against application sense. of the law common sense yeah. <laughs> has to be a little better thought out so yeah agreed okay you're not stopping kick out especially who was the player he Trindle, was like Brandon. Trindle, half yeah. his size. Yeah, <laughs> you're not in any way going to stop Kikau from where he was. That should have just. But letter of the law says there was an impeded obstruction, whatever it is. Yeah. But this only makes a lot more sense now, through the game that you're going to review, that was on after it, where there was another referee incident. Yeah. Because yeah. he he basically fell over and goes. So, so you got in my way. Yeah. And then the other bloke <laughs> pushed the ref out <laughs> of the way. Yeah. Not with any malice no. or like he's not putting hands on a referee because he's annoyed with what the referee did or said. Yeah. The referee was in the way and it was just a natural reaction to wanting to defend someone. Yeah, that's right. To just move him out of the way. You're that's in my it. way. Yeah. And, anyway, and I jumped ahead, but yeah. it's important that those two things be compared. That's right. That's right. And I think they're being compared very poorly mm. by the NRL, but we'll get to that. Mm. Um, th there's, a there's a specific decision I wasn't a fan of, right? And it's not the bunker decision of, like, I think Talakai knocked it on into Preston's foot. Um, I could be wrong about that. Um, it was hard to tell. Like, all these decisions the Bulldogs fans are upset about, I get. There's a decision that the Bulldogs fans aren't upset about that I am. And it's three tackles after this happens. The ref calls the game back, goes to Britton Nakora and says, you shoulder kick out in the head, it's a sin bin. I hate that so much. You can't 
if you didn't see it then, you've missed it. Too bad. Mm. You can't let three tackles go and then call the game back, blow the penalty, give Bulldogs the ball back and then sin bin him. Mm. Even if even if they saw it and then wait for the next stoppage in play and then sin bin him. Yeah. Right? I know there are complaints there to be made, oh, but they didn't get the advantage they should have. Too bad. Yeah. The game was played on, they didn't see it. Yeah. I hate that it was called back and he was sin bin I agree. For it. I agree. Because there's already so much happened since that time. Yeah. Okay. We do live now in an era. We spoke about this last week. There yeah. are microphones and cameras everywhere. Yeah. The the benefit of review. Yeah. Fine. If you pick up something that was and that it was bad. Like he, he lent into it. He launched himself. Yeah. Okay. It's come into your earpiece at that tackle. Just stop play. Send him off for 10, do whatever. Don't call a penalty. Just tell him to play the ball from where yeah, the yeah. play left. That Yeah, or just wait for the next stoppage and sin bin. Yeah. You know, it's like in soccer, they, they let the play go. The next stoppage, they'll give a yellow card if it's, you know, if they played the advantage. Yeah. It's it's that sort of thing. And and why they didn't see then then the Bulldogs fans can really come in here <laughs> and uh and they can say, Well, why didn't the, the touch judge or the, the main ref on the field see that? Because it happened right ne- next to the touch judge. Why didn't they see that shoulder to his head? But they were able to see an apparent block from Jacob Karaz, which wasn't a block at all. Mm. Um, you know, why they weren't able to see a couple of forward passes. They saw the Bulldogs forward pass, like things like that. Like, you know, it calls into question. I get that. I get the questioning, but I don't, you know, Bulldogs had their opportunities. With the technology that we have in the game, <laughs> we got to start doing something about being able to rule on forward, <laughs> forward passes. passes. Yeah. With the technology we have in the game, you can look at knock ons, you can look at everything. You're telling me you can't put a sensor in a ball. Put a straight line up against one of the lines and say, look at how it came out of the hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're telling me you can't do that in the game? I don't know why they're so stubborn on that. To be look honest. at every single rule that they have changed yeah. and how much they're mind-screwing people with the <laughs> frequency of all these changes. Yes. And of all the things in the game, they still can't rule on a forward pass. That's so true. That is so true. I am starting from today. <laughs> we are going to rally... <laughs> rule on the forward pass Hashtag Rule on the forward pass <laughs> Hashtag rule on the forward pass I love it Well with the amount of stoppages They're bringing into the game They may as well They may as well honestly It's not really going to slow the game That much more down Like they're reviewing They're reviewing field goals now Like You can't really slow the game more Down more than what you have So just yeah. Just throw that in yeah. For the forward passes Just change.org Change.org <laughs> petition <laughs> It works <laughs> Yeah, for, for some. For some, <laughs> not for all, for some. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, but that that's the referee controversy there. A few things in the game. The shark sliding defense was good again. Um, they've been impressive with that. Uh, the forwards really laid the platform well for them. Um, they the, the Bulldogs forwards again didn't really show up like they they're not Poor really bloke got knocked out first tackle yeah yeah that was sad Oof. heavy run heavy run yeah started um, well yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right I it mean, pretty much summed up the night for the bulldogs you, you could see he wanted it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah the want is good right <laughs> the intention was good the outcome um, terrible yeah poor guy and like it was it was sad because just the head knock you know what and a he, golf board you see it yeah yeah he's out for next week like that was automatic gone for the 11 yeah, days. It's Saturday, yeah. 11 days. Yeah. yeah. Um, but here, here is where I, where Bulldogs fans, I need you to listen up. Okay. Bulldogs fans. The spiritual son is about to give you some gospel. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Go for it. So I've been hearing everything, everything from the Bulldogs fans. I've watched vlogs. I've read comments. I've spoken to mates, you know, whatever. Here is here is the truth, okay? I'm giving it to you straight. <laughs> the Bulldogs' attack was actually impressive. I know we only scored one try. I understand that. Trust me. <laughs> as good as anyone, I understand, okay? But the attack has improved. What, ha- what we failed to do was finish, okay? What we failed to do was finish off those, those moments, but the attack was there. Broken lines were there. Um, uh, you know, free arms were there for offloads. Uh, 
things things were happening okay a foot went out you know um a lack of support maybe the foot the foot the foot went out Maybe if he went to MJ Podiatry. If his foot was treated <laughs> and if he was a bit more free to move, <laughs> maybe he would have timed a little better. That's right. We That's know a right. guy. Yes. And we know a guy who's definitely visited MJ Podiatry, but we'll get to that in a second <laughs> as well. So, um, so uh, yeah, I mean, the, the attack is there. You can't, you can't say there's no attack. Like if you watch that game back, they're... they're the start they're, is they're good. The intention is good. Yeah, yeah the intention... Of, but the, the execution is there right until that final pass. Mm. You just need that final, you know, and no one's up supporting sometimes or whatever. We'll, we're going to get to that in a second too, uh, which really bugged me. The other thing is this Drew Hutchison, this whole Drew Hutchison thing, okay? Listen, I'm not saying Drew Hutchison is the answer to our halfback woes, <laughs> all right? I'm not saying he's our long-term halfback or whatever. What I am saying is from what we've got, Drew Hutchison is doing everything right. He made one error in the game and then that everyone wobbly, just went, Hodgson's got to go. That Hodgson's wobbly pass. Go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you see his face as soon as he's dropped it. It's like, oh. you can see the, yeah, <laughs> the regret in his face. Now, do I think Toby Sexton is a great halfback? Yes. Do I think Toby Sexton will be offering much different to Drew Hutchison? No. Speed? Yes, he's got on Drew Hutchison. Drew Hutchison is an extremely slow runner. Okay, he doesn't have he doesn't have that speed or acceleration. I get that. Everything else, he's doing right. His we've scored three tries this season. All right, <laughs> we're, we're in seasons past. <laughs> in seasons past, they were hard to come by. That's right. That's right. Three tries scored. Two of them have come on the right side, where Drew Hutchison has run the play. There was a disallowed try also on the right side. Drew Hutchison ran that play, okay, where Wilson steps out. The right side is looking deadly. The thing that Hutchison needs to do is move left and right, control both plays. He does it sometimes, but it needs to happen more often. Burden also needs to do the same and move to the right side, and he's, he hasn't done that at all. Ever since you said that the other week, I watched the Bulldogs game. I had some time on the weekend. Yeah. Burden is always left. Yeah. Never, ever moves. I've noticed. Yeah. So that's that's a problem, right? But all this flack on Hutchison, it's got to go. I, even if you think Sexton is better, you, all the rip on Hutchison is is unwarranted. It, like actually watch the game. His defense is is ten times better than Sexton's, by the way. And I'm not I'm not against Sexton. I, if if next week Sexton's in the team, I don't mind. But Hutchison's defense is a million times better than Sexton's. He saved a couple of couple of tries um and uh in attack yeah he might run slow but his plays are great his passing's on point um he hits the line well and then gives you know and gives taff time as well so that's another thing blake taff's defense and positioning is still bugging me a lot <laughs> he was he was in a good position once in the second half take took a grubber from or twice took a grubber from the end goal and got out which is good. So it was an improvement from last week, but still bugging me. So a few things that are really annoying me. The thing that really annoyed me the most is that we don't have burden, especially supporting. And I have some video footage to, to show on this because it really annoyed me. Then we also don't have Blake Taff, who's like, we all know good fullbacks are around the ball. At all times, they're around the ball and they're ready. Taff is never there. Ever. When Burden made a break in the game, the only person supporting was Sam Hughes, <laughs> our front rower. And Taff is just jogging behind. He wasn't ready for it. Like these things, a fullback's got to have his head up and, and he's got to be around the ball, right? The rest of the team is just nowhere to be seen either. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you this. This is, um, in this video, it's every time Kikau got the ball early and broke the line and had an arm free. Now, I'm not saying he was looking for an offload every time, but if there was someone there to offload to uh, and they called for it, then he would throw the ball. He strikes me as a type that would be looking for the offload, but he's yeah, just had no times. one. Yeah. So twice he's clearly looking for the offload in this video and the other two times he just takes the tackle. Mm. But if someone's there calling for it, he's 100% throwing that ball. So just have a look. Have a look at... 
kick out getting early ball, which is all the ball he got, by the way. They don't give him whole running opportunities or anything. Okay. Early ball. That left foot step. Look, Burden passes and stops. Mm. Okay. This is a trend. This is a trend. Burden is the main problem here because he should be supporting. Mm. Have a look here. No Burden on the inside again. Mm. And here, Hutchison to Burden. Now, kick out. And free arm. Where's Burden's the nowhere to be seen. So that's three, two line breaks at least gone begging, but one try definitely. And again. And again. And mm. Burden's not on the inside. He's reacted late. Mm. And it was bugging me the whole game because I was, I was seeing kick out had the game of his life. Well, what I, say. I think that that's almost endemic of, a, of an attitude thing yeah. because there was a point in that half where Burden did kick and it got into the in goal. He was the only chaser. Yeah. And um, whether or not the team, the team should know. Like you, we, it's a reactive sport. Like you, you've got your set plays, yes. but then when a kick goes in, chase. Yeah. If there was a line of dogs there, which I've seen in past years, yeah. that attitude of just stepping up in defence, Burden led that charge, chased hard and would have got him in goal, their yeah. fullback in goal. But the guy had too much speed for Burden, got around him and the bloke got out to, I think, 15, 20 metres yeah. Yeah. before yeah. the first line of defence was there. <laughs> that is really poor. Yeah. And you hit it on the head. Burden supporting, fullback supporting... Those special players, I remember in the Ben Barber era. Yeah. Benny Barber was everywhere. Yes. Like the football almost sought him out. Yeah. Is yeah. where he was. The ball bounced right for him. He was always in the right position to support. There's no support there. With the Bulldogs attacking weapons that they have, you change the attitude in defense and support and the Bulldogs are winning a lot more games than they're losing. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And then completely. people stop putting crap on Hutchison. Yeah, they're just looking for someone to blame. They're always looking for someone to you know, blame. You know who was always in support? Avarillo. Yeah. Always. <laughs> That's, this is very true. Yep. And Jakey had a, a good game point. with the Dolphins. No one's done it like Barber. Barber had, yeah. had the ball on a string. Mm. But I've never seen a fullback like Barber in terms of being in the right place at the right time. Mm. Honestly, I've never seen it. But there are fullbacks in the game who just have it. And that's one of the things we've spoken about. You can't teach. You can't teach that no matter how much Instinct. you try. It, that's exactly what it is. And Avrilo had it. Um, Taff obviously doesn't have it. Burden stopping on the inside is really annoying. Mm. <laughs> He's A lot of throw them, the ball and not just Burden, but it was like these guys are, it's almost like they're anticipating the next play and they want to be in position for the next play rather than reacting to the moment. Yeah. And Agreed, that's yeah. where we're talking about things like those. That's that extra effort. That's the conditioning. That's the, yeah. okay, I've got to sprint back here to be in place for this, that and the other. But if these guys are running on the inside and outside of each other and supporting, um, the attack looks a whole lot more dynamic. And the most dangerous people, not just the man with the ball, but the decoy runners and the guys that are actually moving. This happens in any sport. The easiest person to guard, defend, is a person that isn't moving. Yeah, that's right. But if there are constantly bodies in motion, yeah, then you're gonna you're gonna create overlaps. You're gonna have the defense second guess themselves, and that's how you you put it on. Mm. But if these guys are just going one out or they're passing, stopping, passing, stopping, it's very predictable. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. It's, they're just giving up on the play, on the chase thing. This is just a random thing I noticed. Um, so when teams kick off, the player will put the ball, generally speaking, the player puts the ball like on the tee backwards and then they boot it so it's high and long, right? Mm. And it takes longer for the team to, for the op opposing team to catch it, throw the ball and get there. Yeah? So usually sets will start uh, on the 10. Mm. I just noticed this on the weekend. It was really weird. Burden puts the ball as if he's kicking a conversion. And then boots it. So it's not that high. It gets in their hands pretty quickly. The Bulldogs chase is already soft and slow. And they're, the opposition team's always starting the set on their 20. It's just a weird thing. Yeah, yeah. And like we know... Just fix those small things. It's a game of yardage. Yeah. We know that. So strange. The super coach, 
the spiritual son has spoken. Yeah, that's that's my uh, that's my take on the on the Bulldog Sharks. Hey, Ant, um, yes, you know your in your time of reporting on New South Wales rugby league, um, I've heard so many South supporters who watch New South Wales Cup say that TAF is a five eight. What are your opinion? What's your opinion on that? Um, I was speaking to someone about this before. Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> um, so what is he? What do you think? At the moment, I think he's a New South Wales Cup fullback. <laughs> oh. Tell um, us what you really think. <laughs> no, the the uh, so I. That's I, a uh, little sneak peek into his Bulldogs team. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I just, I think, uh, so he had good performances at fullback for Rabbitohs in cup and first grade. He had good performances in five eighth for Rabbitohs. He had good f- performances off the bench. So I'm not saying he's a rubbish player, but I don't think at the moment in the team that he's in that he should be playing first grade is like not for the Bulldogs. Okay. And like people, are, people's. It's, it's almost similar to Burden, right? I understand when people say get Burden out of 5-8. It's, if Burden's playing 5-8 at Panthers, if he's still there, he's carving up. Because I, I don't think it's fair to say Burden's not a 5-8. Because mm. I think he's a pretty quality 5-8. I just think that he's been played around with so much at the Bulldogs. Like you made a great point in last week or two weeks ago that now he's just unsure of what his actual role is. I think he ran the ball too much on the weekend everyone's happy with the way he ran but i think he ran it too much um but like yeah like it's it's almost it's kind of like that it's like at the bulldogs not sure not sure about taff mm. he's uh he's not too reliable in the air either um high balls he's dropping he's uh he's short like he's got a, mm. you know he's anyway I'll, I'll speak about a few things once we get to the bulldogs team well it's a good <laughs> point because you can be a great player, but it all depends on the system that you go into. Yeah. And so Taff may have been good and a first grade fullback or five eighth at the Rabbitohs, but look at the players around him. Yeah. I just mentioned it the other week with Addo Carr. It's like look at him at Melbourne. Yeah. Now look at him at the Bulldogs. <laughs> like, yeah, he's getting on in years, but if he had quality people around him then there'd be a lot more try scoring. There'd be a lot more more of an ability to actually, you know, be the Ferrari that he is. Yeah. Um, but it's just not happening. So, yeah, you make a very good point with Taff. Like, he might be a first-grade fullback in any other team. Yeah. But the reality is for the Bulldogs, we need special players yeah. for that team to actually rise up. That's right. And we need a safe fullback. Mm. That's the main thing at the moment is every time that ball goes up, surely, uh, I'm going to speak for most Bulldogs fans here, we're panicking mm. when it's going to TAF because we're thinking, we don't know what's going to happen here. So, yeah, the f- just on the f- quickly, sorry, on the forwards as well, they're not giving good go forward. So those who are attacking the Bulldogs attack, uh, you can't really do much unless you have good go forward. So the forwards really need to improve there. Anyway, that's our... Our Bulldogs hot take for the moment yep. <laughs> on the recap. Yep. Um, Sharks were, were, were great. Uh, Nico Hines is, by the way, leading the Dally M race. The Dally M voting's a joke. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> um, but, but he played well. Whatever. He, <laughs> he did his job. Um, then we followed up. So this was a complete quality shift. <laughs> so we went from the Bulldogs Sharks to a noticeable shift in quality when we watched the Panthers Eels. What a game. That was a top game. And you could just tell quality their quality teams going going mm. against each other. Um pains me to say that about the Eels, but they're really they they're doing really well. Um Panthers took the win, 26-18. So pretty tight game. And uh the Bips picked the Panthers. The Bips. So three from three for the Bips. Bips tips. <laughs> That's right. So with three from three, they took the Panthers. Great tip. Brad Arthur's rotation, this is something I forgot to mention about the Bulldogs, is as bad as Serrato's rotation. Uh, that's not something I'm not a fan of with the Bulldogs. It was extremely poor with the Eels as well. Mm. Um, it could even be worse. 
So Bailey Simonson went off in the like inside five minutes for HIA. Firstly, he puts um, Kelma Tuolangi in centre, which I thought was interesting because he's got some people like Ryan Madison or um, uh, Sean Lane who could even potentially like sort of shift into centre. I think they might have been better fits, but anyway. Then in the 53rd minute, Kelma Tuolangi, the replacement centre, gets injured and he goes off. So now there were two, two players left on the bench. One who hasn't played yet after 53 minutes, Brendan Hands. And then the second player. Uh, Brad Arthur starts substituting between the one player off the bench. He doesn't even use his second one until three minutes left of the game. When his side's losing, he puts Brendan Hands on with three minutes to go. That's so strange to me. <laughs> that was so weird. Uh, but anyway, it is what it is. Um, Dylan Brown is Ill's key player. The only thing Mitchell Moses has on Dylan Brown is his kicking game. Dylan Brown has a good kicking game, but Mitchell Moses is just better. Other than that, Dylan Brown's passing game is better. His decision-making is better. His running game is better. His speed is better. He's, <laughs> he's like, he is their key, key player. Mm. So He set up a few beauties. The, the, his pass selection yeah. in that game, he was just finding gaps. On point. And even like to step back in and then throw mm. the ball out, like to create that, that gap. He's having a season. It's a couple of games in, but he's having a season. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a great player. Mm. Great player. I really like Dylan Brown. The Panthers, uh, their play fell apart a few times in the game. Mm. They weren't as polished as we used to seeing them. That's right. I heard they're trying some new things in attack, all that kind of stuff, maybe, but they didn't look like the the three Peters that we're used to. That's right, yeah. And um, it's like I've said it the past couple of weeks, they lost players and it's noticeable. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I have no doubt that they'll get better throughout the season, but it just remains to be seen how much better they get. Um, what was interesting was the Panthers forwards, for the first time in a long time, were rattled. Mm. Ill's forwards were really taking it to them. So that was really interesting to see. Um, Liam Martin, for the first time and probably the last time, had a bit of a stinker <laughs> he threw a few shocking passes yeah he was rattled rattled i'm telling you these forwards were were off mm. um so in attack and defense he was a bit weak but i think that's the last time we'll be saying that about liam, <laughs> liam martin he's he's, he's a great player. player um what i liked about the panthers was that no matter how much like when they were losing they never panicked they just followed their game plan yeah. which was great um, their first try was crazy. Like, it seems really simple. And when you watch it back, it just looks like nothing. But Cleary's ability... So usually when you put a kick in, whether it's a bomb, chip, grubber, whatever, you drop the ball in front of you and you just you put a kick in, you know? He had a player in front of him. So he dropped the ball to the side and stuck his foot out and just put the most perfect grubber in. Like, it's hard to kind of describe. Yeah. Um, it was great. Can't stress how great that was. It's a bit hard to explain. Just go watch it back and try and understand how hard it is. Try and do it <laughs> and then understand how hard it do is. It. <laughs> do it. Do it. Just do it. Do it. <laughs> um, but that's the that's the Panthers' ills. Uh, Raiders' Tigers. So Raiders took the game out 32-12. Um, the Bips tipped the Raiders. So we're four out of four. <laughs> well done to the Bips. Well the done. Bips. <laughs> I won't um, be tick tipping the Tigers again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. So as soon as I, I, I was like, I understood your tip. I'm not going to lie. I was like, yeah, could be. Mm -hmm. Then I saw the team list and I went, yeah, sorry. I'm <laughs> I have to apologize. Ethan Strange. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What a player. Me too. So far. Wow. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> He yeah, and strange well. at all. <laughs> <laughs> what a player. He's doing great. Yeah. He's, he's filled in really well. well and done. it's big shoes to fill, man. Like you're coming into Jack White and spot. Gonna keep an eye on him. Yeah. He's mm. doing really well. Um, look, it seems like I'm picking on him. I've picked on him two weeks in a row. Jaden Sullivan. Uh I, I think he's barely a good five eighth, let alone a halfback. He got named he got named at halfback. I don't mind that Lachlan Galvin was picked for his debut. Um, you get worried that people are picked too young. Mm. 
But if anyone knows about being picked at a young age, it's Benji Marshall. So you got to trust his decision. He um, got up at five thirty in the morning to make that decision. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Let's quickly speak on that. <laughs> Let's quickly speak on that because that's 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 a joke. People are people are bagging him out because he said he wants to spend time with his family. Mm. Like. Is that really how far we've gone <laughs> that we're going to bag someone out for wanting to do their job and then go and spend time with their family? Unfortunately, yes, we have come that far. That's crazy. You have to be obsessive compulsive mm. um, at the top. And the moment you walk in and you break that mold and you say, I'm not going to be that way, I'll give you everything I have, but not at the expense of my family, people start freaking out. Because he's putting family first. Yeah. And look, at the end of the day, we all know, okay, any one of us would drop what we're doing in a heartbeat if we knew a family member needed us. Yeah. Like, come on. Yeah. Let's get real. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> That's right. The bloke puts in the work. Okay? Yeah. Okay. He puts in the work. He's been around the game. The game has been his life. It's given him a lot. He's giving back to it. Yeah. But I can't believe that was even a thing. But look at what they go. It's the cultural destruction of the family. Yeah. It's just like, well, if you're not going to prioritize your job over your family, then you're going to be bad at your job. Mm. Give me a break. Honestly. And if anyone is out there thinking that we've thought too deeply into this, uh, no offense, but you need to think deeper. <laughs> Um, enough said about that. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so um, yeah. Uh, uh, look, how Jaden Sullivan could be picked at halfback and Aiden Caesar put at fourteen? Out of this world, ridiculous to me. Maybe he did it before he had his morning coffee. <laughs> so he got up at five thirty. Goes, Sullivan's a good idea. <laughs> then he has his coffee and goes, Oh no, I've already released a team list. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> Just back yourself. Back yourself all the way. Um, Sorry. Go on. No, no, please. Let's. Like that, that's crazy. Sullivan at 14, okay. Like I get it. But if I were if I were Marshall and I'm looking at that team, Jake Simpkin is at, is at 14 for me. Backup hooker. I think Jake Simpkin's a really good player. Anyway, um, that's, that's extremely weird. Um, we spoke about the Raiders. I could be very wrong about the Raiders. They're doing really well. Yeah. It's like they're coming first. Yeah, after two games, <laughs> after two games. Go Ricky. Um, Yes, he's he's doing great. Big Ricky Stewart. Um, yeah, I mean it'd be good anyway uh, if if they if they do well. I'm not convinced that they're top eight yet, but they're doing great. They're doing better than second last, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I mean th there'll be plenty to say about the Tigers. It's their, it was their first game of the season. We were we were pretty easy on teams saying you know it's first game of the season. Mm -hmm. Errors will be made, things like that. Chemistry. We'll, we'll be the same on the Tigers. They're still ahead of the Bulldogs. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually true. <laughs> that's very true. Well done. <laughs> and uh, in fact, they're still ahead of the Knights. Mm. And uh, we come to the Knights now. Good segue. So thank you. Thank Smooth. you. <laughs> um, and we come to the Cowboys-Knights game. Cowboys took the game out 21-20. Extremely close game. It was a great second triple header game um, on that Saturday. The Bips tip the Cowboys for this one. And so Bips are currently five out of five. Wow. Very impressive from the wow. Bips. Um, now, the Knights were off last week. Much better this week. And uh, honestly, like they did let the game slip mm. a little bit, but the Cowboys really stepped up. Mm. Didn't panic as well, like I said about the Panthers, just did their job. Tom Dearden is a star. Star, star, star. Mm -hmm. Like, other than his rubbish fifth tackle option with the game in the balance with like 50 seconds to go. Other than that, that's a that's an error. Um, he was on point. The bravery, the courage, the power to hit a crash play when your team's down. Um, to know, Firstly, to have the vision to see that there's an opportunity here. They're like reeling in defense near the line. And to hit a crash play as if he's a front rower. That's insane. Mm. Such a good try. Mm. So Tom Dearden, star. Um, it was a good finish. Valentine Holmes. Had a nut, mate. Missed that conversion. He was having a shock of the whole game. Yeah. Three errors, 
like it just wasn't out of on. character. Wasn't on. Yeah, it wasn't on. You have those games. Almost like Liam Martin. Very yeah. rare that he'll have that. Yeah. So he'll he'll be back. Um, that's about that's about it for that. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Storm Warriors. Oh, come what a, on! What a game! Come on! Oh my goodness! <laughs> Thirty twenty six to the Storm. Now let's get this out of the way quickly. Congratulations, Bips! All right, you did great. You tipped the Storm. You got what is it now? Six out of six. Six from six. Great work. All right, get over it now because we got to talk about the game. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, listen, what a game. Wow. So, Storm, firstly, let, let's give props to the Warriors, right? Mm. This is a serious team. Mm. Warriors of old have no chance in this game. Down 18 6 at halftime to score 20 unanswered points against Storm is ridiculous. To come out and dominate the half the way they did yeah. against Melbourne Storm in is Melbourne. crazy. In Melbourne, yeah, is crazy, right? And so I was happy because I was like, oh, I'm going to get my tip right. You know, <laughs> go Warriors. And I was watching it with my brother and my brother goes, I can't believe like, oh, you knew the Warriors were going to win. And I said, this was like 10, 15 minutes to go. I said, you can't rule the storm. Like you can't, you just can't rule storm out. Mm-hmm. And then he goes, no, nah, I'm ruling him out. And I said, no, you can't. You just don't know. You don't know. Then he got to three minutes left and I go, maybe I can rule the storm out now. <laughs> <laughs> and then this outside in play is old school storm. That's Cooper Cronk, Billy Slater, whoever their second role is at the time. Sometimes it was Ryan Hoffman or whatever, mm-hmm. you know. Um, that's nuts. That that outside in play is so good. They scored it on the left and they scored it on the right. The exact same play, Pappenhausen on both. Yeah. The second role gets the ball off of Jerome Hughes, who had a solid, solid game. And we'll talk about Jerome Hughes. Um. Uh, Hughes to the second row and then second row just cuts it back on the inside, pops it on the inside. Pappenhausen just runs straight through. So they were two brilliant tries. They got that to come within two points with a Nick Meany, you know, composed conversion to bring him within two. Quality player. He is. An old bulldog. Moment silence. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, uh, then someone who we know surely has been to MJ Podiatry with a foot like that to jump six or seven meters from the line. Mm, healthy feet. <laughs> healthy <laughs> Definitely. feet. Definitely. That is ridiculous. If I'm going to lose my tip like every week. That's the way you want to lose it. I'll, I would love to lose it that way. The try heard around the world. Amen. That wow. has to make it. That has to make it worldwide. Wow. That one has and to it's, go viral. it's trending already. Oh, is it already? It's funny, the Americans, because they've just had the round in Vegas and everything. Yeah. This try is going viral and they've seen it. Uh, but Americans are like, we see this every week in the NFL because oh. they, they don't have to ground the ball, obviously, in the NFL. Yeah. You just have to get it over the line. So there have been NFL players that have done like front flips over people yeah, and true. all sorts of things, but they don't understand the concept of us grounding the ball. Yeah. And so to have done that with that type of body control and athleticism and actually ground the ball – was one of the greatest things and Mick Ennis called it on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> greatest try ever. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That right. was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. And the wingers in our game, they train for this now. Yeah, that's right. It's like how athletic can you be? And that's one of the greatest I've ever seen poetically against a defender who is known for that type of acrobatic try as well. Yeah, yeah that's in, um, right. In the, uh, in the man with the perm. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. That's right. He He's great, but wow, what a try that oh, was. That's that's the best finish I've ever seen. Yes. Like in terms of tries, not best game finish, mm. although it's one of the best game finishes mm. I've seen. It's one of the best finishes to a try. No, sorry. It's the best finish yeah. I've ever, ever seen. Yeah. To jump it genuinely was six or seven meters from the line. Mm. And to keep your body in while you're almost upside down, yep. to keep your body close enough to the line. Yeah, the collision that flips him. And then to just the ability to get the ball down right before his hand touches. Yeah. yeah. What a try. <sighs> what Xavier a try. Coates. And uh, I think it's appropriate now um, to talk about 
uh, not to take away from the beauty of Xavier Coates' try, mm. Jerome Hughes. So yeah. this is what you mentioned about the ref. We pray that common sense will prevail in all of this, but do tell the story. Yeah, well, what happens is, so Rocco Berry gets the ball. I believe it's when Coates knocked it on. I could be wrong. Um, but then Rocco Berry gets the ball and he's running down the middle to score a try, right? Hughes is there. He's always trying to get there to make the tackle to save a try, okay? And it's in a crucial moment just to add to all of the pressure. Not that that should even matter, but just to give context. And the ref is in his way. Mm. So Rocco Berry is basically running directly at the ref and Hughes needs to get to Rocco Berry. Okay, so all that happens is it's a little nudge like you said, with no malice, no, it wasn't out of annoyance, like get out of the way, anything. All it was, was a little nudge to get him out of the way so he could make the tackle on Rocco Berry. And now he's facing a one match suspension. And if he pleads, uh, sorry, if he um, appeals it, then, and, and is found guilty, risks a two game suspension. May common sense prevail in all of this, <laughs> I hope. This is exactly that that thing again is yeah. understand the moment, okay? That's not an intentional laying of hands on a ref, okay? The argument could be made if it was um, an obstructing player, would he have just gone down and said obstruction? Yeah. Or was it because it was the ref that he felt comfortable to push him and try and make the tackle? Because we've seen it in the game, it's riddled in the game now, where there's an obstruction or a shepherd being run and guys that you know can make a genuine effort to tackle the player will brush the bloke's shoulder and go, oh, yeah, and fall, fall yeah, over yeah, and then right. they stop the play and yeah. they disallow the try. That's so right. you see it in play. This was a unique one because unlike the Bulldogs game, he actually made a genuine attempt to tackle the player and yeah. didn't care who was in his way. Yeah. The referee was in the way. Get out of the way. <laughs> That's it. Um, so whether or not that was poor positioning from the referee, which it was, uh, where's the referee supposed to stand? You know, like, but I really hope common sense prevails. They challenge I it. Too. I hope they challenge it and it just gets let off. Yeah. I hope. Well, hopefully he's not suspended in the first place. So he's got to face that, but... But the reality is he's looking at a one-game ban, which is which is ridiculous. Um, also, what that would say is, what that would suggest is that he should have hit the ref, bumped into the ref and fallen yep. with, that, with those dramatics, like that dramatization, and then called for a replay of that, that play like it happened with the Bulldogs or whatever. Yeah. So that's all they're really doing there. He but has I, to push him. I think in both situations, Bulldogs game and this game, common sense should have just prevailed. I agree. Just let I it agree. go. Like... Look, weigh it up, you know, yeah. weigh it up. Like, how can they rule a penalty try for sometimes? You know, they, they review things on a penalty try and say, yeah. and they'll say, we know that this guy could have grounded the ball had it not been for this. Yeah. If yeah. they can do that on a penalty try, why can't they say, well, yeah, the referee got in the way, but... Um, a rampaging kick out. A kick out. Isn't... Yeah, would have would have trampled this this little bloke. Yeah, yeah, like, that's right. So regardless, yeah, obstruction. But really, at the end of the day, we know with certainty he wouldn't have stopped him. Yeah, a bit of common sense. That would be great. That would be great. And I like I, all right, you're trying to protect refs. You don't want people to make contact with them or whatever. Like, but that's like you don't want someone like shoving a ref or yeah or punching him or whatever. Like yeah, something yeah. like that is nothing, man. Come yeah. on. Yeah. Anyway, that's in the game. Yeah. A decision needed to be made. There's too much going through people's minds. We get to it again. Yeah. We get to it again. It's like sometimes people do silly things, say silly things. Okay. But it's heat of the moment. It's in the mm. game. Know the context. Show a bit of common sense. Yeah. A couple of incidents where they weren't even silly things. Modern day not. Pharisees. Yes. Modern day <laughs> yes. Pharisees. Yeah, that's right. It's all about the letter of the law. Mm. Great, great analogy, mm. comparison. Uh, yeah, anyway, um, great, great, great game. I'm so happy I watched that mm. that game. Awesome. Now we have the Manly versus Roosters. So this is the Sunday clash. Hope you got to mass before or after this again. 
<laughs> and uh, Manly took it out 21-14. Kudos to Manly. Yep. I got my tip wrong and so did the Bips. The Bips, unfortunately, went with the Roosters. So now we're six from seven, Bips. Uh, but great start anyway. Um, Roosters were a bit all over the shop. So I guess we can say it's only round two. They'll get better. Man, they're looking good, man. They are really looking good. Josh Alloway, first hit up of the game. Yeah, he's always looking to put shots on as well in beast. defense. I love beast. it so much. What a beast. He's such a champion, man. Loved honestly. It. Loved it. Love his energy. Love yeah. what he brought to the game. Those halves, man. Wow. They're Manly. Honestly, Manly are going to do well. They're real contenders. Brooks looks good. He yeah. looks good in a Manly jumper. Yeah. He looks good, man. He looks good. Oh. His running game, stepping, he looks good. And Cherry Evans, DCE. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what? I used to always have a problem with DCE. I thought he was so overrated. I thought he was so inconsistent. And he would just do one or two good things a game. And then everyone would be like, oh, he's the best halfback. Which I still believe, by the way, at that time. Um, now he's really just consistently showing up. Yep. He's really become a leader. Yeah. And, and that's helped Brooks massive, like big time. Um, they're looking so good. Healthy, fit, everything great. Mm. And that's when you know that they've been conditioned well. Mm. You know, they're doing some good contact stuff in preseason. That's those teams that don't cop the early injuries, like <laughs> like you look at the Bulldogs and you go, how soft have you been training <laughs> that when you come to a game and actually get hit, you get hurt, you know? Uh, no, that's just a rip on the Bulldogs. Huh? I'm being a bit unfair. But like, you know that they've been conditioned well. They're doing really well. Not our Karaz though. Nah. Karaz is giving up 110% every Carving time. Carving up. I'm going to rip one play in the Bulldogs when we get to the preview though, but we'll get <laughs> to that. <laughs> no, um, no, honestly, um, a massive, massive attacking threat, Manly. Doing great. Anyway, um, let's move on to the last game. Recap, Dolphins, Dragons. Absolute wonky game, I'll say. Dolphins belted the Dragons 38-0. I half expected it. Yeah, you did. You called it. You called it. You said you got that tip right. A Wayne Bennett Dolphins. coach team. Yeah, not losing two in a row. I think you'd have them up for this game. Oh, right. He had them up. Mm. Up, up and away, I say. <laughs> um, the Bips tipped the Dragons, unfortunately. So six out of eight is a is a respectable tipping. That's a good start. Well done to the Bips. Um, yeah, the Dolphins were just too good. They just they showed their quality. Avarillo got a start in the centers. He did, got a try as well. Yep. Well done to him. Yep. I still think he should be moved to fullback and Hammer to center. Mm -hmm. Now, in saying that, Hammer had a much Hammer, better game. Hammer came out. Yeah. So yeah. attacking is always a threat. Mm. Defensively, like he saved the try. So, I mean, it's an improvement. I still yeah. don't think he's the greatest defensive fullback. Mm. And I think Avarillo offers more. I think Hammer can do what he does from center. Mm. Like, he'll be okay, you know? Okay. Um, but but I don't want to sound unfair or anything. He had a cracker game. Mm -hmm. So, he did well. Good, A good comeback from last week. And uh, Dragons seem to have just gotten a bit ahead of themselves. I think they got too happy from their win in round one. Yeah. And I think they just didn't show up. Um, so that's just, I mean, these things can be good for teams. Mm. Like someone, like a team like the Dragons, who I think are really, really going to improve this year. I think something like that will say, okay, we can't come into a game and just think we've got it because we've won previous week. We need to really show up. You know who I love just watching his energy? He's a utility player, comes off the bench for the Dolphins, the big guy, Sam... Um, he just That's comes on with energy. Utility. The Dolphins. Forward, forward. Sorry, he's a forward. Comes off the bench. Ooh. Um, Sam, we're looking this up. Yeah. Because I saw him. I saw him celebrate one of the Dolphins' tries. Yeah. He's on the sideline, hugging his teammates, looking to the crowd, getting him to get up. Because apparently he's a Redcliffe boy. Sam. Sam. I think he's, it's either his surname or his first name. On the bench? On the bench. He didn't start. He comes on. Uh, there's Josh Kerr, Mark Nichols, Jared Wallace, or Kurt Donner, Donner, here, Donner here. Am I getting the name wrong? Have a look-see. <laughs> <laughs> Have a look at the photos and see. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't notice Kenny Bromwich was moved out of the 17 and it's a replacement. That's sad. Josh Kerr. Oh, it's Josh Kerr. 
Oh, he's a former dragon. Yes, Josh correct. Kerr. So he's a Redcliffe boy, apparently. Ah, okay, I didn't Josh know Josh Kerr, but he comes on with gusto every time. Yeah, he's good. And he just carries and goes forward. I think he's become a bit of a cult figure at the Dolphins. Yeah, I reckon he'll be one of those guys. He's pretty good. I like him. Mm. I like Josh Kerr. Sam, where'd I get that from? My father. <laughs> Maybe my father's <laughs> name. <You were> close. <laughs> Shout out to dad. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, Josh, it was no. close. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? Sam Kerr. Oh, <laughs> Sam why. Kerr. Uh, you know what? Yeah, that's right. That's probably that's what Sam is. Kerr. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great pickup. Mm. All mm. right. Well, that's... Uh, <laughs> that's uh, Good finish to the uh, to the round two recap, and um, we're gonna have a an almost quick fire preview. Yep. Um, of round three, so all different sorts of injuries and potential suspensions and things. Um, so we're just gonna fly through. Think about the teams. Maybe a key player's out. Oh well, too bad. All right, let's just get our tips through. We don't have our social queens tips. This week? Probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Probably this a good is, thing. Let's not get into true. this controversy. Right. Yeah. There is an against the grain oh controversy that's happening right before your very eyes. <laughs> I have it on very good authority that there is a member of our team that will go unnamed <laughs> that has changed their tips after production. <laughs> This is an against the grain mortal sin. Yes. And so we only get to tip once and once. Mm -hmm. Once only. That's right. If you change your mind, live with the decision. You only get to tip once. That's right. Now, I mean, if I'm going to defend a little bit, it was part of the person's work tipping comp that they tipped differently to how they did on the against the grain podcast, which to be honest is pretty sickening. Because this is the more serious one. No, <laughs> oh, that's a double controversy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Double right. controversy. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Better we don't have. Yeah. I don't have the voice for it today either. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Well, um, uh, anyway, Socials Queen can submit her tips uh, separately away from this episode. Yeah. Sorry about that. But Af- anyway. After round three, she can give us her tips. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's right. Probably still stuff up anyway. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Anyway, so let's get to the Thursday Thursday night game is a is another solid one. Panthers Broncos. Great game. Great game. We're at both teams coming off a win. It's in Penrith. Mm. Blue Bet Stadium. Ooh. Who are we going with here? I'm gonna go Penrith. Penrith? Wow. Penrith. Penrith. And uh I think I'm just going to go upset off the bat. I'm going Broncos. Okay. Yeah. Hesitantly. Okay. I don't I don't know. All right. I'm going weird tips this week. Yep. All right. So we head to Friday. Friday night, 6 p.m. game is Warriors against Raiders. This is in Christchurch, New Zealand. Warriors. 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 <laughs> um, just a little thing on that is uh, the way after the game – even after the conversion was taken, once like after full time, everything was done. Johnson, Sean Johnson was still, the team was in a circle and he was still giving it to the Warriors after. So that's, that's a real winning team there. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so, and they're showing glimpses. They just, they've let it slip twice. I reckon the home crowd will get them up. Yeah. Because it's hard yeah. to go against Canberra the way these t- first two games have been. Yeah, that's right. But away from home, I think the Warriors, they'll be hungry after what they suffered at the hands of Melbourne. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, um, yeah, all right, unanimous, at least from us. And uh, here we go, this, the good old Sydney derby. So, we have Roosters, Rabbitohs. Roosters, Roosters Rabbitohs. at home, Allianz Stadium. How much does that matter? Sydney, Sydney. Maybe a little bit, actually, but mm. who are you going with? I think the Rabbitohs will come good. Wow. Here's, oh, sorry, here's the breaking news on this. Mm. Apparently, they're dropping Lachlan Ilias. For who? Uh, what I would assume would be... Is Jack Wyden back this week? Jack, Jack Wyden's back. So I would Wyden's assume in. Wyden's in... Cody Walker is seven, maybe. Yeah. I'm going to go Rabbitohs. Hmm. I'm going to go Rabbitohs. Interesting. I'm going to go Roosters. I'll be going for South, though, but I'll go for Roosters. I'll pick Roosters. You know what's interesting about this? Have I mentioned I hate the Roosters? I don't know if I've mentioned no, that. Are you serious? Episode. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> not on today's episode. Wow. Yeah, not a fan of the Roosters, but I think I'm going to be cheering the Roosters on this week. Okay. And for that reason, I'm just going to tip them. Yep. Because it ruins the game if I tip Rabbitohs and I want Roosters to win. Mm. And it's a really hard one. I'm going Roosters and I'm hoping they win just so that I can shove it to Rabbitohs that they were that they're blaming Lachlan Ilias. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm going for. Well, also moment. think we need to all support the Rabbitohs because the following week we'll be versing the Dogs, all right? Good Friday. The Rabbitohs Good Friday clash mm. that no one will be watching because it's Good Friday. Busy. Take yeah. a day off, everyone. Yeah. Give it to the Lord and His passion. We'll watch it on Easter. Just yeah. watch it back on Easter. Yeah. You'll be all right. Yeah. We can go a Good Friday without going to the Easter show or a footy game. I'm pretty sure we can. Yeah. My challenge to you all. Yeah. Get to the 3 p.m. service. If you want to watch something, watch The Passion or something, you mm. know. Mm. Just. Well, this Friday. again, this goes into the whole, if you're not moving with the liturgical season, you're never going to really engage with the depth and the beauty of our faith. Yeah. It's again, it's another distraction because you don't want to think about the fact that Jesus died for you. Mm. That love is so powerful and sometimes so scary to know that someone actually died for you so that you might be able to make it to heaven. Give him that day, everyone. Give him that day. Amen. Amen. You might get a reminder when, when the time comes. <laughs> oh, you will. You yeah. will. <laughs> um, so that's yeah. So that's Friday done. We're heading on to the Saturday triple header again. Now, the first game here is the Bulldogs versus Titans. Where at? It's at Belmore Sports. Doggies. Ground. Doggies. <laughs> uh, back to Belmore. Des back um, to Belmore. Des, yeah, Des back to Belmore. Oh, they will boo him. I think so. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, look, he put, he put to us be in honest, this mess in the first mm. place. That's right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. He and uh, I don't think Raylene. Raylene Castle gets enough credit for what for her part in all of the Bulldogs yep. woes as well. <laughs> mm. um, now, look. I'm I'm just gonna put this out there from the beginning. But Bulldogs are they really struggle to get up for for like a massive event. They they don't really know how to G up. <laughs> and so the back to Belmore thing really doesn't uh doesn't help my decision here. Mm. They always lose at Belmore anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. They don't know how to get up for an event. It's really annoying. Like you know, like yeah. have some fire. This isn't, I told you, I'm not going to tip with my heart this year. Yeah. But this isn't a heart decision. This is just a progression decision. Mm. I think they're going to come good against the Titans. I'm thinking so. Yeah. I think they're going to be good against the Titans. Yeah. I think they're, they're just kind of, I suppose, you know, just chipping away at what needs to be done. There was significant improvement against the Sharks. And then there's a few tries in the last 10, 15 minutes of that Sharks game. But um, they show have, have shown that they can do things with the ball. Mm. So if they're on this week and they're able to finish, and make those little tweaks, I think the dogs will come good. So I'm going to tip the dogs. Nice. Well, I hope someone there's someone in the coaching camp at the dogs that's got the eyes of Anthony and can show them how they're not following the person with the ball. <laughs> um, but I'll be tipping the Bulldogs as well. Yeah, I I'm gonna go Bulldogs too. The only thing that scares me is it's a Des Hasler talented tight inside coming out of a buy, coming off a buy. Sorry. Yep. It's the only thing that worries me. Valid. But I'm thinking the Bulldogs hopefully hopefully show up. Mm. Um. Which brings me to the player I was going to rip was Josh Adokar, who was acting as if he was dying on the field on <laughs> in round one. Probably was, poor guy. <laughs> but then he's ready for round three. He's back in. Have they apparently, named him? Uh, the teams aren't named yet. Teams aren't but named But apparently he's looking... Uh, apparently he was close for round two. So he, he's probably set for round three. Okay. Thought the bloke was out for like six months, the way he was, <laughs> the way he was reeling in pain in round one. Anyway... Probably is. Mm. I think he needs surgery, but they're just he's gonna play through it this season. Okay. Um yeah. All right. So all right. Bulldogs. So far they're favourites, by the way. Could change. Uh now we have a really interesting one, I think, is Dragons against Cowboys. Dragons home game. I'm gonna tip the Cowboys. Mm. I like the way the Cowboys have been playing. I think the Dragons will stand up. 
after that poor performance against the Dolphins, but I still think that the Cowboys will outclass them. Mm. Good tip. Yeah. I'm going to go Dragons. I reckon Flanagan's going to rip him. Wow. This week. I think he will too, mm. but I don't think it'll be enough against the Cowboys. I really rate the Cowboys. Yeah, me too. <sighs> Damn, that's a tough one. They're really tough games, but I'm, I'm going Cowboys. <sighs> you said it. <laughs> yeah, I know, but a close win then. Sometimes after a close win, they don't show up the next week. Mm. Like, you know, anyway, you don't know. Todd I Payne's just think Dragons coach. will have a bit more desperation. This could set the tone. They just got flogged this round. Yeah. Um, and I just can tell Flanagan will be getting in their ear, like from that perspective. Yeah, he'll yeah. he'll cover them up. Um, all right, that's a hard one. Anyway, good divide divided uh, tips there. All right, Abuna, this is on you. Mm. Tigers, Sharks, at Leichhardt Oval. Ooh, Tigers, Sharks at Leichhardt. Sharks look good. Sharks look good. I don't think the Tigers. The couple of tries they scored, they looked all right. That young 5'8 yeah, came in. Yeah. Looked good. They had a good They're at home. Yeah. They're at home. They've they've had their first game. Maybe they got the cobwebs out. I think this might be the upset of the round. I'm going to say Tigers. What are you <laughs> doing? You just said earlier <laughs> that you'll never tip the Tigers again. <laughs> I, I won't be tipping, tipping the Tigers again. The tigers again. Tigers again. <laughs> I wanted to keep everyone guessing. Literally, yeah, well done. Well done. No, Literally came in and said, that's the last time I'll tip the Tigers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tip the Tigers. <laughs> the tip was unmerited. There you yeah. Go. yeah. No, no, I'm just weighing all that up. I think the Tigers at home, Benji's had that first round out of his system now. I think the team will know what where they went wrong and a home crowd... I think the Tigers will get up. All right, fair. I'm um, tip Tigers. Fair. Uh, Leichhardt means nothing, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> they got... Uh, hang on, hear me Savage. out. Hear me out. <laughs> so swear. don't forget. So don't forget <laughs> Robbie Farrow's last game. And, well, it could might not have been his last game against the Sharks um, to get into that final eight position. And Tigers lost to Sharks. Wow, good memory. And that was Robbie Farrow's last game. Mm. Oh, and then don't forget Tommy Redonick is the week he died. That was the game at Leichhardt. They had a Tony, Tony, Tommy Redonick's jersey on the seat and everything. They got s- <laughs> <laughs> they were leading <laughs> half time or something. They had the big lead and they still lost. So, <laughs> no. Nah. May his soul and our finals aspirations rest in peace. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I will that not seems make horrible the, to laugh at. But that was really good. Terrible. It's funny. So I will not make that mistake. Yeah. Um, I will be tipping sharks. Nice. And that's it. <laughs> nice. Um, I, I, I think the only chance Tigers have is if Aiden Caesar plays halfback, and uh, I'm still going Sharks anyway. <laughs> yep. So Sharks take that out. Um, I will be really upset <laughs> if Tigers win that. <laughs> That'll burn me so much. <laughs> anyway, now we move on to. Wow, this is interesting. I don't know if it's because it's still really early. So it's Sunday. We've got Ills against Manly, Combank Stadium. But Ills are favourites. Not in my eyes. <laughs> I'm going to tip Manly. Yeah, fair. Fair, I think. Yeah, I'm going Manly. I think it's probably maybe just because of the home home advantage. But I'm picking Manly. It's Ills, Ills home. Combank. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's why Ills are favourites. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. I thought you were saying you're tipping Manly because no, no, no. <laughs> I, I think that they might be they they might be the favourites because it's the home game for them. But yeah, uh, I'd still think Manly will yeah get the it. Far out to rule Manly out like that. Mm. Maybe later on it'll change. But um, these unanimous ones really get me nervous. But I'm going Manly too. Mm. Sold. And uh, here we go. So Knights versus Storm. Knights versus Storm. Interesting one. Night's home game? Potentially without Jerome Hughes. Mm. Night's home game? Night's home game. McDonald Jones Stadium mm. in Newcastle. Mm. Knights fans really know how to turn up to. If, if only the Knights players <laughs> could turn <laughs> up to the storm. <laughs> 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 Look, I think wh- who would their backup half be if... Keswick. 
Pezzett, yeah. Who's Pezzett? <laughs> Jonah Pezzett. Um, he's good. He's He was playing the trials. He was he looked impressive. Okay. Yeah. I think their structures, their system, Melbourne are looking good. I'm going to tip Melbourne. No, isn't Pezzett playing 5-8? Because Munster's out. Munster's out. I think Pezzett is a natural halfback though, so I think he'll play halfback. Who are we going to 5-8 then? Wish well, let's just assume that common sense prevails and Jerome Hughes will play. Yeah, but I doubt that. <laughs> NRL lacks common I'm sense. A, I, just sense. I think Melbourne are just a system that people slot into. They're too well coached and they're playing well, so I think it's going to be a Melbourne victory. But historically, Knights can... I said this about Warriors last week, but I think Knights are even more of a bogey team historically. For Storm than mm. than the Warriors are. I'm still sticking Storm. Okay. I reckon um, Pappenhausen has a point to prove against Ponga. I reckon I reckon Ooh. Melbourne's going to put a number on him. Uh, in all honesty, I wasn't trying to sway your tip. Or no, anything. no. I was just letting you know everything yeah. I know, <laughs> which isn't, which is clearly not and much. I, just that I one step. I take it on board and I value it because you're our expert. I appreciate that. And I take it on board, but from what I've seen, yeah. Actually, this tipping comp has been actually pretty interesting because I find myself now just to unwind at the end of the day. I watch those 15, 20 minute highlight videos. Yeah, the extended ones. So, um, it, and I'm, like, I'm looking at the form, I'm looking at the way people play. I'm, I'm into it. Mm. So I think, I, d- I just think Melbourne will be too good. Yeah. In everything I said, I think, <laughs> I think Storm will belt them yeah. <laughs> as well. Um, you never know. It could be a close game, but Storm mm. are just old. They're looking old school. Yep. And I love it. Pepinhausen's looking just next level, I reckon. Just something yeah. about about his presence on the field. He's obviously playing confident. Yeah. So he was in the trials and obviously last year as well was a bit conservative in the way he was playing because of his injury. He's just full guns blazing now. Yeah. Mm. And um, a little more of those outside in plays. Yeah. Very hard to defend against. Your tip? So, yeah, Storm. Storm. Belt. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So. All right. Summary. Yep. In summary, um, I'm, to be honest, I'm going to struggle to remember my tips. In summary, we have Panthers, Broncos on Thursday night and I've gone Broncos. Correct. Thank you. And uh, the Friday night game, first game, Warriors, Raiders. I've gone Warriors. Uh, Roosters, Rabbitohs following that. I've gone Roosters. Uh, with heart and head, to be honest, for that one. And uh, Saturday, triple header. Bulldogs, Titans in Belmore. I've gone Bulldogs for their first win of the season. Dragons, Cowboys in what will be an interesting game. Cowboys to take that out, though. I think they'll be too strong. Sharks, uh, sorry, Tigers, Sharks at Leichhardt Oval. I think Sharks will just be too strong. And Sunday, we finish off with a double header there. Ills, Manly. I've gone Manly. And night storm, and I've gone for a storm belting. So that's round three. Round three, and dolphins have the bye. Round three. Yep. Now, that's it. last week we asked you. Oh yeah. If you had an <laughs> option, if you had full control of the bulldogs team mm-hmm. of their top thirty squad. Yes. Who would you put in what positions? And we'll spend just a few minutes on this and then we'll get into our big hit and we'll wrap the show. Yeah. But you have free reign. You're the spiritual son. You're the footy guru. <laughs> Everyone has to listen to what your decision is. Oh, gosh. What are you doing? Well, look, um, I'm, I'm backing myself here, okay? Now, I'll, I'll be very honest. With the 30 that we have, I, my team's not too different. Like I had, I thought it would be. And I had a look and I was like, okay, Maybe not too different. Now, it just just depends. So, if I'm going with my round three team, it's not looking too different. If I'm going with my round 27 team, it's looking a bit different. Okay, so if I'm coach and I'm not thinking about what Serrato is realistically doing, if I'm now right now coaching the Bulldogs with their top 30, um, realistically... I didn't want this to happen at the start of the season, but I'm I'm going Stephen Crichton at the at the back. I'm yep. going Stephen Crichton fullback. I was 100% against this at the start. Now, 
this is where I get a little bit controversial. I'm not saying I think he would do a good job at fullback, and I'm not saying I think he should move to fullback. What I am saying is I think Matt Burden has the physical stature of a good fullback. So is there potential? I don't know. You mean Stephen Crichton? Him. No, Matt Burden. I'm oh, you want to put Matt Burden at fullback? I'm talking he could be a, a backup if we wanted him out of 5'8", right? Okay. Um, Stephen Crichton is – the reason I'm going with him is because we need a tall, um, strong fullback and a confident one. And he's, w- without a doubt, the most confident player on the field for us, right? So he's safe at the back. Um, I wasn't unimpressed with Connor Tracy, but I, I just think a strong build – Strong, tall, whatever, like I said, we need at the back. Then we've got the wings. So I've been bagging out Josh Adokar. Um, I wouldn't mind if he's not in the team, but realistically, I thought if I was the coach, the leadership he brings on the field, I've probably dismissed a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'd have Blake Wilson and Josh Adokar on the wings. However, for in defense, when... On last tackles, when there's a threat of a bomb coming up, I'd be dropping um, either of my centers back. And my centers are... So this is a bit questionable. If I have Bronson Sherry next to um, Josh Adokar, it's a bit questionable to send him back. But I think a bit more trustworthy than Josh Adokar. But I would have Karaz on the left which is a bit of a weird one, but I would have him there to, to help Adokar out in defense, especially for those high balls. So I'd have Karaz and Bronson Sherry in centers. Mm-hmm. Jarrell Skelton is obviously another one that Bulldogs fans want to see. I would not be mad if he was in the team either, but they're my back five for the moment. Mm-hmm. So Crichton at fullback, Wilson, Adokar in the wings, Karaz and Sherry in center, in the centers. Then I've kept Matt Burden in six. Um, I like him at six. I do. If he has a halfback running the team. At the moment, I'm not unimpressed by Drew Hutchison either. So I've gone Hutchison in halfback. If Sexton was there, I wouldn't mind either. The tough thing is I don't see them in training. So <laughs> I only have games to go off. Um, and I'm impressed with those halves. Like for for the first two games. Then what I would do is for my front row, I would start Max King and Sam Hughes. Uh, Sam H- The reason I would start Sam Hughes is because he's obviously an impressive player, but he doesn't bring much impact off the bench. So I just think start him. He'll be good for a start, right? Hooker, I've got Reed Marnie. Now, um, actually, I'll mention this when I get to it. So Reed Money at hooker is like a shoe in basically, even though I have my problems with Reed Money. Um, second row, same kick out and Preston. Now in lock, I don't mind Jamin Salmon starting, but depending on <laughs> this is like getting technical, but depending on how I'd see them train, right? <laughs> it would depend if I start start Jamin Salmon or start Kurt Mann, because in the games Kurt Mann's been so impressive and his ball playing has been so good. So has Salmon. But man's been a lot better. So, um, I don't mind Kurt Mann coming off the bench either. But Jamin Salmon, I've got Jamin Salmon just in my 13 because he hasn't done enough. Oh, sorry, he hasn't done bad enough to be kicked out of my 13. Now I've got 14 Kurt Mann. But what I have Kurt Mann on in 14 for is to get Reed Marnie off the field. <laughs> so, as much as I like Kurt Mann in lock... Um, and like things could change. I might get like in round 27, I would have Kurt Mann starting 13 and Bailey Haywood coming off the bench to go and hooker because that seems to be the way they're going, even though I want him to play halfback. Um, but I would get Kurt Mann in there to take Reed Marnie off. Reed Marnie can play a 50 or 60 minute game. And for the remainder, um, it'd be Kurt Mann. Yeah, so it's like 30, 30 to 35 minutes. In the first half, I would say 30 minutes of the first half, Reed Marnie, get him off. The The last 10 minutes of the first half, first 10 minutes of the second half, Kurt Mann in hooker. Depending, like if he's going well, just keep him. 
but um, then you can get money back on. And if you wanted to finish with man, you could as well. Like things like that, I think would help him out because he's doing a lot of work in defense. Uh, then the bench, I've just got uh, Poe, Farmacilli, um, assuming he's fit, obviously. We said a fully fit side, right? So Poe, Farmacilli, Josh Curran and Curtis Morin. Curtis Morin has got to come on and he's got to stay on for as much as he can. Like... And he puts that much work in that he gets tired, jump off. That's fine. Mm. I mentioned the rotations I didn't like of Serrado's. He's moving forwards mid-game and I hate it so much. Mm. So he's starting Max King and Farmacilli in, in the front row, right? Then say Farmacilli stays fit for the game. He takes them off. And so say he'll, he'll take Farmacilli off and he'll put Josh Curran on. And he'll put Curran on in prop. Then he'll take Salmon off and he'll put Curtis Morin on. And he'll move Curtis Moran to prop for some reason, even though he's a natural lock. And he'll move Josh Curran to lock. You know, whatever. And he's just moving all the forwards around. Then he'll take Max King off and put Kurt Mann on. And then now Josh Curran's got to move back to prop. And then Kurt Mann's now lock. Like things like that, you know? Mm. Um, horrible, horrible, horrible. Like <laughs> you can't just keep changing their positions. So that's my 17. It's not overly different, like I mentioned. Um, it's just in key specifically defensive areas and specifically under kick pressure. Uh, I'm going against my word at the start, Crichton at fullback mm -hmm. and then Karaz helping um, Adokar out on the wing. Is Haywood already coming off the bench or no? Uh, not in first grade, no. Okay. So he'd be an inclusion for you? Yeah, he would be. He would, would be you, an inclusion. So you yeah. wouldn't start him at halfback if it, this is your team? Do you think he has it in him already? Oh, oh yeah. This is my team. It's your team. Man, I would start Bailey Haywood at halfback. <laughs> 110% I would okay. start. Yeah, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I said it and then I completely forgot. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 110%. I think he's got the composure. He won't be... He's coming into a losing side, which is always dangerous, right? Yeah. But I think he's he's shown his maturity mm. and how level-headed he is that he'll, he'll just slot in. So not too early for him? You think? No, I don't think so. Okay. Even if we gave him till, you know, say round five, even round 10 if we're pushing. Mm. Um, but get him in when the season's still alive. Yeah. That's the main thing. Yeah. Because we've seen the Bulldogs like mm. back end of the season when they're out of the comp and they're playing with nothing to lose. Mm. They start winning, right? Yeah. Um, which is another thing because you've got to let them play what's in front of them. You can't... Mm. Bulldogs are nev have never been a structured attacking team. It's good to have structure, but then play what's in front of you. Um, if he's just coming on and playing that way with nothing to lose, then it it's a detriment to him when he starts playing with something to lose. Yeah. Right. So get him on with something to lose. Mm. Oh, hundred percent. And then if that's the case, then I'm playing Kurt Man. Um, yeah, it's definitely a, yeah, the yeah, hooker yeah. replacement. This is your team. Yeah, I forgot you're about the guru. That. I was like, you, you're the decision maker. Yeah, that's right. Gus comes to you for advice. Mate, I'll be And Serrato says, what do I do, mate? What do I do? You've got to help me out of this. Yeah. And you say, come with me, my child. <laughs> I will show you the promised land. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. Haywood is going straight to halfback, 100%. Yeah. Um, and he'll take control. And, and if I was like, if I was in that position, I'd be telling him this is your team. Mm. And I'd be saying to Burton, back off. Mm. You know, like... When we need big kicks, mm. <laughs> um, burdens for it. That's yeah. when he takes control. Yeah. Like get the ball and, and put a kick in. Yeah. Other than that, just stick to your five eight running yeah. game. You know, yeah. whatever. It's like five eight's almost a second fullback, mm. or a fullback's almost a second five eight in attack. You know, mm. um, Haywood yeah controls that team. And there if and if I'm Gus Gould, by the way, I'm seriously looking at Adam Dewey to come in as fullback. I would be having a chat with him to say, would you play fullback for the Bulldogs next year? Because he's coming off contract. Mm. We need someone of that physical build to be playing fullback for us. We can't have these short guys. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. There's your 17. Security. 17. There's your 17. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Stay tuned for Anthony's 2029 Bulldog side. <laughs> 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 no, Very good. Let's get physical. Let's get physical, physical, because we already got spiritual. <laughs> spiritual. <laughs>
That's good. That's good. I'm going to give him that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know how I feel about that anymore. It's good. It's good. It's uh, good. I like you. it. So, um, there was no really... Re- there was a good big hit in the Storm Warriors game, but then I watched it back. I loved it, but I thought it's not... It didn't look as impactful as it probably felt for the player. Mm. So, I've just gone an old... And it, I couldn't find one for the whole round, really. So, I've gone an oldie. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, but we'll get to that in a sec. So, uh, <laughs> so it is now time for... Father Ben's Big Hit of the Week. Proudly brought to you by Totals Tours Clothing. So, please... As always, check their links below. Um, have a look at Totos Tours. Don't just evangelize through your words and actions, though that is very good. Um, also evangelize through your clothing. So, as I was saying before, um, in honor of a, a debut coach's... Um, oh, sorry, a coach's debut game mm, this mm. weekend, I thought we'd, we'd give this big hit. Something Benji-inspired, maybe. Mm. Let's go. Good guess. Oh, this is a rep game. Australia versus New Zealand. It is. Here we go. Yeah, oh, we big <laughs> hit. Benji. <laughs> wow. He could be a wrestler. He looked like he sold that as well. <laughs> Look at this. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get up early enough, Benji, to avoid that one. I'm sorry, champion. Wow, we. And that's. Big uh, one. Big yeah. hit. There was a big hit you missed, actually, from the week. Which one? For old Jeremy, Jeremy Marshall King. <laughs> what happened to Marshall King? Oh, the... <laughs> the Falcon. The Falcon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did you, but did you see how rattled he was? Yeah, poor guy. Like, he was on his knees and he had that, like, I've just been hit like a boxer when a boxer gets yeah, hit. Yeah, so true. And their eyes are... And he was like... And the stars, yeah, you can, you yeah. Can see ben, the stars. Ben Hunt's <laughs> reaction was good, too. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. But he also helped him, which was nice. It was... Uh, that was that was big. That was big. Yeah, but sure that's that, a, hey. <laughs> that's a nice. No, you don't. You never want to be on the receiving end of something like that. Yeah, but true. Benji took it like a champ. Well done. Got back up. It's pretty kept accurate, fighting. Uh, as he'll take all of the criticism like a champ. Ah, uh, nice. He'll get back nice. up and he'll. I'm praying Benji has a good season. That was nice. I, I was gonna say it was a pretty accurate depiction of his debut game. <laughs> it coach. was, but he'll get back up. He'll get. But that back was up. a nice way to say. He'll yeah, get back nice. up. Well, that's another episode. Mm. Um, we're approaching the holiest of all weeks in our liturgical calendar. So I hope everyone is really entering into the spirit of that. Um, I didn't mention it at the top of the show, but we've got the Camino of St. Joseph yes. coming up as well. Uh, we just had the Dominican Sisters Day Retreat at St. Mary's Cathedral. That was amazing. Hundreds of women in attendance. Awesome. Many priests there for the Sacrament of Reconciliation, Adoration, great talks, great spirit about the day. So well done to the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia um, and to all the ladies that rocked up on the day. I'm so glad, I'm so glad that you got to have that experience in this Lenten journey and we pray for its success into the future and maybe maybe more to come. So we'll see how we go there. Um, it's been a good episode. Great analysis, good tips. Beautiful conversations. On Beautiful the conversations. <laughs> so we thank you all for being with us. If you haven't yet, like, subscribe, comment and follow on all of our platforms. And to be part of the Bips Tips, <laughs> you've got to subscribe. You've got to like us on Instagram. You've got to do all that kind of stuff. So follow us. Um, share our page with your family and friends. If you're part of 40 million different WhatsApps groups, send our YouTube link to everyone. We'd really yeah. like to get those subscriptions up. Um, you click those notification bells and do all that snazzy stuff <laughs> so you know when we actually release our episodes, which is now Wednesdays, as we've advertised already. But really, word of mouth, I've, I know you've mentioned in the past, I get it and I got one throughout the week. Um, that someone who doesn't really go ever to church has been watching our podcast, listening to our podcast. Oh, awesome. And we're giving them further and further insight into the faith while having a bit of fun with things. And it's a nice little bridge. So we pray for all those people that might be a little bit distant from their faith and 
not really involved with it anymore. Whatever you're going through, the Against the Grain team, we're with you on the journey. We're a non-intrusive way of coming into your hearts and in your homes. So we want you to keep following us and liking us and we're here for you. This is why we do it out of love. We're, we're delivering what we think is a good product <laughs> and we know that it's doing good to a lot of families out there and we really um, encourage you to persevere in the journey and to continue su to support us as we support you with our prayers. And we'll finish with prayer. Awesome. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, as you have entered into your hour, we thank you for the great sacrifice that you're about to make. We ask that we all be given the courage and the insight to pick up our crosses and journey along that narrow path to Calvary, where you, Lord, hold the words of eternal life. We ask that you bless our listeners and viewers in these last two weeks of our Lenten season and help us enter into Holy Week in a spirit of prayer, fasting and almsgiving. We ask all these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ says, You are the salt of the earth. What good is salt if it loses its taste? So stay salty. And don't be afraid to go against the grain. God bless.
I won't be tipping the Tigers again. 